So I did this at uh, Cosmica. Some of you may have seen, some of you went to that to understand it. Uh, and my name is Oliver Depay, and I do work for the Medical Research Council in North London, but none of you heard me say that because this is entirely off piste. Um, and I think what that makes me is uh, a biopunk, a biohacker. I'm not a, I'm not a engineer or a physicist or anything like that. I'm a molecular biologist. But for many years, I've had an interest in what we now refer to as astrobiology. But I think we could go back to before astrobiology emerged as a discipline in the mid 1990s. Uh, what I'm going to describe to you today is a sort of astrobiological uh, desert road trip um, of <coughs> enthusiastic amateurs. We knew what we were doing within our various disciplines, but we were not working for anybody, but well, in fact I don't need to elaborate on that because that's what most of you do when you fly your balloons effectively for pleasure as enthusiasts. But what we were trying to do is <coughs> try and do molecular biology at high altitude to look alike, and I'll take you through the reasons for that in a minute. And so as well as actually trying to build a balloon and a payload to do this, we were also actually doing exactly the equivalent of taking, you know, um, building something in your shed but actually trying to do molecular biology in a shed, or in my case, actually on an on a old baby changer that my daughter's grown out of, it's in the corner of my bedroom. We have a little sort of mini, mini lab and workshop there. So we sold it away and sort of tried to come up with a, a home-built master biology payment. So that's what I'm about to describe to you. And this, by the way, is a book that describes this emerging movement of people doing molecular biology as a hobby. It's exactly the same way you would solve the things in your bedroom or in your shed or whatever people starting to do actual molecular biology and biochemistry at home because of the agents are available and safe and cheap enough to do that. And I'll show you our approach to that in a minute. And we were funded by the National Endowment for Science and Technology and the Arts, and that was some fun we had in some downtime in the desert, which I'm going to describe you with a, with a time lapse camera. Uh, now, at that time, Nesta used to fund programs like the Crucible program, which was entirely centered around building unusual collaborations. So there is this you know, idea that if you do build an extremely unusual collaboration between distant people, scientists and artists, physicists and architects and molecular biologists or whatever, that, that you, know, you get a sort of brainstorming effect. And when people are outside their silence, they will come up with novel ideas. And if you build an environment where you can discuss those things openly, you know, without any people come up with ideas. And that was the scheme to bring this all together. And then there was project money you could bid off, not there anymore, unfortunately. Uh, and I was trying to come up with a sort of mainstream project. And my job, day job, was actually trying to build a laboratory robot to automate molecular biology in the lab. And I wanted to do something like that. And somebody said to me, no, we're just not interested. You know, we're, we're, we're architects, and that doesn't interest us. If you could think of one thing you'd really like to do, what would it be? And I said, I'd like to do astrobiology. I was an intern at NASA for a while, about 10 years ago. And actually, that really excited them. It excites you. You're all in a sort of similar field of, of space research or near space research. And I think it does have this sort of uh, visceral interest that people forget. And very rapidly, we managed to make a project out of it. And uh, the actual project I came up with, because I was aware of uh, some highest two billion groups in the States who, who worked with my, with my former colleagues in NASA, was a, a balloon-borne uh, bioperspective project looking for life in the high atmosphere. And various people have said they found it. I, as a medical biologist, I have my doubts, and I wanted to build a payload that we could really go and see what we'd, uh, what we'd found. So I worked with a, a group of colleagues, there's a photo of them later, a lot of these pictures are taken from a, a blur book built by one of my colleagues for this as well. So you might see, you know, lots to be copied in various places. That's what I'm through. She's fine with it. You can buy that book if you've got it in um, So, balloon project, relatively easy to do, as you all know. Uh, this is a, or something you can probably know more about, this thing that I got off, uh, off the internet. And the red line is uh, temperature. Uh, the pressure has got chopped off on the side, but there's pressure up the side. Um, we're down here in this filthy bit, the troposphere. So you would expect to find life there. You go up, it gets extremely cold until you get to the stratopause. Um, and then we, you know, we, we're flying our balloons up here. And wherever people look, they seem to claim they found spores and bugs in there, but I have my doubts. As a physical process, 
to get stuff into the high atmosphere. Um, <coughs> there's certain air currents that can do it, a volcano can do it, forest fires can do it. So there's certainly sources of convection and other natural currents that could carry you know, tiny particles, spores, or bacteria into the atmosphere. So it's because from that point of view, it's quite possible to imagine that it gets up there. Whether anything lives there is a different matter. It might just go into hibernation and drift back down. Even that would be use, uh, interesting, of course, because it's a possible way that disease can be spread across the world. And there's certain evidence, particularly with, say, um, uh, foot and mouth, that that could drift hundreds and hundreds of miles. And whether things could drift further in the atmosphere, I don't know. If you can go and find it and prove you did it in a very valid, scientifically vigorous way, then you can say, look, I really did find something that looks like a pathogenic bacteria at altitude. I think this is a disease vector. Craig Venter, by the way, the guy who, um, you know, uh, sequenced the human genome, amongst other things, he uh, was very busy taking air samples at sort of ground level and seeing if there was a lot of bacteria in a cloud and so on. And I haven't heard anything further about that. Maybe he didn't find anything particularly useful, but he, he certainly had a similar approach lower down, and a very vigorous air sampler guy. And maybe some of you can build a balloon for one day. Um, okay. <laughs> Not for now. I've ordered an iPad, I'll just tell you something that would make. Right. I'll just leave it on too long. Okay. Um, <coughs> The other thing about this graph is it gets close to, or above freezing over here, You're very cold in the tropos, tropos pores, but not too bad over here. And for, to my mind, there's a sort of sweet spot around 100,000 feet or so, when the temperature is above freezing for some of the time, and the pressure is enough that although the boiling point of water is very low at high altitudes, it is not you know, it's three or four degrees. So you can have liquid water persisting in terms of both pressure and temperature at high altitude. And any astrobiologist will tell you that we're nearly wherever you ever find liquid water you find like. So then there's a possibility. And you could make an argument that there's little, you know, little um, uh, flecks of dust, something like that, with some water on it, bacteria living on it. And most astrobiologists would accept that as a perfectly reasonable premise. And um, there is, for instance, talk that even in the atmosphere of Venus, there are some bits of Venus where the temperature isn't too bad and there's even some moisture in the clouds. We have bacteria in the clouds of Venus, although they're almost certainly not on the surface. So clouds and atmospheres as habitats this is the version theme, and this is what we were looking at. Around about 100,000 feet, that's what I had in mind. Now, the next graph is uh, the, boil as the vapor pressure of water against temperature. That's in Tor, what's a Tor, I can never remember. <laughs> anyway, here we are, around here, 100 degrees Celsius, and that's the boiling point of water, right? That's where it exceeds, the vapor pressure of the water exceeds the pressure of the atmosphere, and it just starts to But that is, of course, not the linear graph. Now, the reason I've shown you this is uh, if you're looking for something, if you're looking for Amanda Knox's DNA, something like that, you carry out something called a liberated chain reaction. <laughs> um, I expect none of you know what that is, but it amplifies up. He knows. We'll come to you later. Who are you? James. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see? I'll just look at you for the rest of the talk. Yeah, okay. Anyway, so we've got the fluorase chain reaction. Um, I won't take you through that, but one of the things that you need to do for the fluorase chain reaction is to cycle it repeatedly up to actually up to a very high temperature, about 94 degrees centigrade. So, to do that, I would need to build some sort of pressure, pressure, I, pressure vessel, I fly at altitude, that can hold a full atmosphere of pressure. And I'd need a, 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 like a Peltier element or something that could repeatedly cycle up to 94 degrees, then it goes to 72 degrees, and then it goes to 60 degrees, and it repeats this over and over again. And they're not very expensive in the lab anymore, but they, they, they take up several thousand watts of power and they're quite heavy, and I need one atmosphere, and I really didn't think that was a useful way to do it. I might actually, if I did it over again, I might consider it, because now the cheapest PCR enzymes are out of patent, they're incredibly cheap, so they're down to a few pence per reaction. So there's something a biohacker might do. Many biohackers have tried to build their own PCR machines. But I didn't think, I thought that was not a good idea. And the other thing that's not a good idea about it is, 
I've got bacteria and evidence that spend their lives at 100,000 feet at maybe 10 millibars. And I'm suddenly insisting that they partake in an experiment at a far higher pressure. And that's not the environment they're used to. Am I going to kill them all dead as soon as I pressurize them before I even get to do my experiments? So what can I do as an alternative to PCR at these high pressures? And it's not a linear scale. And down here, we get to sort of 37 degrees centigrade, which is you know, the temperature we live at. And you, know, you can have really very low pressure. 20 millibars is enough to stop the water boiling. So that, I thought, would be uh, where to aim at. And of course, when the human being replicates the DNA, um, I mean, I have a daughter. Must have, some DNA replication must have been involved in that. We don't have to look ourselves up to 40 degrees centigrade. We have enzymes that do it for us and, uh, in a linear way at 37 degrees. And we can have by those. Uh, from a company uh, called TwistyX. And TwistyX has come up with an enzyme that just functions at that temperature and nothing else, and you mix the stuff together you want, and it replicates DNA. So that's what, that's where we started designing our experiment around. And um, so we, we, there's a, every living cell in the, that anybody's so far found has a, a particular type of DNA called 16S RNA, and that's like the benchmark that you look at to detect where the life is there. So we amplified that. You know, you, except for James, probably you guys probably aren't that interested in the detail. But um, that hasn't, that's not so clear. Maybe you can look at my laptop later, some of you. But this is what I built in a great hurry uh, for a crucible. And it was basically made of four veins, four blades, so to speak, made up of four perforated aluminum sheet. And each sheet, um, these had ice blocks, commercial you know, camper ice blocks. And the reason for that is that going up, it would get very, very cold. So if I had a lot of unfrozen ice blocks in that, would, that would be thermal mass, and they would keep the temperature above freezing, so I wouldn't freeze all my reagents and chemicals. That was the plan, anyway. And then um, <coughs> they would keep it cool on the way down, because they would have frozen solid at that high altitude, and then keep it relatively cool on the way down. And the other problem was if we were operating in a desert environment, it would be really hot when we were sitting on the desert when it came out. I haven't got to that bit. I'll tell you where we launched later. Four blades, each blade had an ice block in, and these syringes firing down into this reaction vessel here, you can see the tubing. Um, and these springs are shape uh, memory alloy actuators. This is all linear motion. I didn't want stepper drivers or uh, stepper motors or anything. So what I use is these shape memory alloys. So you put about three amps through these momentarily and they'll, they'll, they'll contract with about four newtons of force. So I really love these. But then, of course, I have now built a balloon payload which needed momentarily to be able to switch to the three amps. So there's the reaction vessel. That was a fluorimeter because basically uh, what I've done is I've incorporated a dye that bounds to amplify DNA. So as the DNA got amplified, if there was any there, you would get a fluorescent signal. If you beam the right light into it, it would fluorescent at a different way. Like I would be able to see if there's any DNA amplified in this reaction chamber. I mean. So four syringes firing into that. Uh, I can tell you about what exactly was in that later. And I had an air sample. I had a great big syringe that sucked air in and bubbled it through the reaction chamber to see what was happening. So that's like my basic approach. Four biochemicals need to be mixed in series using shape memory uh, Down here, it's not in this picture, there was, a, there was a water heater with a pump in it, and actually even then there was coils of tubing around that to keep them at the right temperature. And um, some of you may have seen me discussing how to try and sample air, keep the, yeah, everything sterile on the way up and then only sample it at altitude. I did quite know how it worked out how to do it. One way I was doing, I was thinking having a quartz a uh, window and a UVC LED and try and sterilize it that way and I would have sampled around the edge of that or something like that. That's kind of what I was thinking about. Uh, that UVC LED was a, a very expensive purchase and I'm, I'm not sure that's the way to go. But that we got. Then we got it the four ice blocks and the syringes, the reaction chamber and the and the UVC, you know, quartz sterile sampling port so you get an idea of what it looked like. And the whole thing was in the tube. And this rather elongated, that's about 37 meters by the way, that rather elongated design is because as well as this balloon opportunity, this was through my former colleagues at NASA, they'd also given us a rocket flight opportunity. So we were trying to fly something 
the similar altitudes by two completely different methods, and that would be a very good uh, irresistible challenge. And uh, so we flew over to America last August, and we found ourselves in a garage in San Jose with all sorts of strange and wonderful things in it, because you know, just like you guys, there's a thriving amateur rock tree movement in the States as well. And being the States, everything's bigger and better. So basically, this group called the Rocket Mavericks, who work out of California, they're, they're a mixture of aerospace engineers and sort of dot-com people and so on. They've got a lot of money and expertise, and they're building these very large cerebral rockets. Uh, I'll show you a key example of that later. So this is the kind of expertise we had available to us, if we asked nicely, although they were very distracted in the rocket range at the same time. So anyway, that was the environment we were working in. And then we drove out to the Black Rock Desert uh, in the middle of Nevada. And the advantage of the Black Rock Desert is that you don't need to file the uh, no time if you don't want to. We did, because it was sort of considered polite, because we, by rocket mavericks, colleagues were flying these enormous rockets, and so we did need FAA clearance. But uh, so they, they want to do a no time for everything. Um, but in theory, if you drive out there, you can just launch it. This is where they have black. Um, this is where they have um, the Burning Man festival. So, so as a biologist, I began to think, well, this isn't a particularly sterile desert. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it wasn't going on then, but you know, God knows what. We did do some background counts. The air you're breathing now has probably got about 300. I can't work. Excuse me. Um, the area you're breathing now probably has about 300, 400 bacteria that you can grow or, or petri dish per cubic meter of air. Um, and the air out there was at about 20, 25. It's not particularly sterile. There's a town over there, there's a gold mine over here, there's hydrothermal vents and railway and roads around. It's a big, big desert, but it's really <coughs> about things that are not sterile. And, um, so it's certainly not a particularly sterile place. So when you're assembling your balloon, this is the absolute thing I'll go on and on about, especially on the discussion group, is that you're assembling a balloon and effectively it's being coated with bacteria the whole time while you launch it. And you've always got the one that that's what you detected. Somebody flew a U2 plane, spy plane, and they said, look, we found bacteria on our sample plate. And I said, well, how did you know you didn't take that with you? Your sample plate was sterile. Your, deployment mechanism is down, or you actually sample the bacteria that just come off the, the cockpit window or off the off the you know the, the wheel well or whatever. Very hard to do. Maybe we can discuss that later, but at least you know we launched in a slightly more sterile environment than normal in the middle of a fairly desolate area, although every year whatever it is, forty thousand people turn up very bad. So it's not that sterile. But it was extremely beautiful at night. Again, you can't appreciate this with the background light because he hasn't done a lot of a lot of mucking around and time lapse in the light, although we were normally a bit like a completely shattered by that one, just fell asleep. And that gives you an idea of the balloon of the sort of payload we put together. That we went to an RV and took whatever tools we could with us. So there's the payload again, with, and we've got a massive wiring taken the high out wiring. Some of the, the petting detail now, uh, some a memory foam which we use to insulate things. And the bit that you're probably most interested in is this bit. That bit is a great big chunk of uh, solid state relays for the 3 amp. Um, 3 amp, you know, turning the 3 amps on and off to go through here. And this is a PC-104 stack. And the reason I did use the PC-104 format as a complete amateur was that the people who I was flying with, who were doing the balloon for us, um, before NASA cut off their funding, which I'll describe later, but they had one balloon left and they were very kind and they gave it to us because they wanted to make one more flight. They'd been flying PC-104 cars, so I'd gone down this route of thinking I had to use PC-104 cars so I could prove like I could play with the big boys and say, look, I've got PC-104 cars too. And because they, you know, the standard is that they're all compatible with each other, and CubeSats are built using that, you're always at a pinch saying, maybe we can turn it into a CubeSat later. The, the, by these, these balloon payload people always had a, an eye on turning them into CubeSats. Some of these were considered to be basically CubeSats on a balloon. So I've used this PC-104 um, car at the base. We've got a, a PC-104 power supply, 
PC104 analog for digital and a PC104 PC like IO32 thing that we used to turn the relays on and off. And you downloaded the relevant C libraries. It was all meant to work. I had a lot of trouble programming it. I don't think I'd do it this way again. Um, but it is one way people can do it. Like some bits of this still work. This bit doesn't. That was the actual, I've taken out of the box, I was going to show it to you as debris, but I think it's interesting to compare the sort of size and power with what Ed and some of the other people described. So it's a, um, a fully formed little computer. It's got about 64 megs, it runs Linux, it's got a, an ARM processor. It had an SD card slot, which I wish I'd used, to, so I had some sort of disaster recovery. You can stack all the other things on it. So it's quite a fully formed computer you could run and monitor off it and so on. The bare board was a, would be a couple of hundred quid. Um, and, uh, I'll pass it around later. If anybody can work out why it doesn't work anymore and get it fixed, I'd be extremely grateful. I don't think I'd do it that way again because it's just too much of a liability and it's too complicated to program. This, very little. This one, very little. But I think the power supply was running at about one and a half times. That's a lot of I know it's a lot of fiber loop standards, but. This, the whole thing was yeah, yeah. pretty big. I mean, you could the greatest weight was probably all the ice packs. Yeah. But you need to think of some way for thermal control. Mm. And uh, if you have a, like a pellet, maybe make it very small. That's why I, I try to make it much smaller. But this is what, in a panic, when I was giving like two months notice of having a rocket bike, like I built in my bedroom. Mm. You know, it's not necessarily perfect. Why, sorry, I misunderstood earlier. Why do you have four ice packs? Because there's four syringes in each. each so we just next to ice pack, basically. <coughs> what, what, what are the four different channels for? Right, four reagents. Uh -huh. The first reagent is a lysis reagent, basically a detergent, which we bubble the air through. And that will, that's what you call an impinger. You usually, to catch stuff, you bubble it through water or something, and you do the air sample. So that would break open anything we saw, including spores, at least the DNA. The second one was the Tristy X. What we then found, though, the problem was you set up a PCR with what's known as primers, the little, little bits of DNA that plant the bit you want, and they were causing a false signal. So we then, the third syringe was some of the digested primers, and then the fourth one was the dye, because the dye interfered with the previous three, so you have to do it the other three syringes. I don't think I can get it much better than that, unless somebody had a... Um, died that didn't find primers. But I haven't got any money now, so I can't try again. But that was like my basic four syringe method. And I you know I challenge any biohacker, you know, without ego to come up with something better. So that's what we flew. And we had, you know, this power supply, that was quite neat. Had the PT104 stack. It's a relatively big format unless people be, you know, what I might do if I did it all over again, my particular approach would probably be to have each of these or bunches of these controlled by Microcontroller, something like a pickaxe, all feeding back on a serial link saying, I'm doing this, you want me doing anything else, and so on, because it's you know, like a pickaxe can take, can take, um, so any pickaxe can like, output serial and so on. And I might have just one of these, the cheapest I can find, to take all the serial feeds because these. Multiple serial ports, in my view, is always a problem, but with these, I don't think it will be because they tend to come from like six serial ports or eight serial ports built in, and they're all interrupting them as well. So, this is the only thing, believe me, my life is full of being tortured by multiple serial ports at the same time with that automation. It's the only thing I really trust to do because the little ports are dead anything else. Anyway, so that's what we flew, and the FAA regulations are that you can have up to six pounds in your payload, you can have up to two six pound payloads. So you can have 12 pounds and then you have six in your one box. There's box number one and box number two. There's a large, uh, a large group of cable between them, or, or maybe not quite within the spirit of the law. Pre-deployed to blue as normal, no cut down. That's the, the tracker payload. And in the States they do things quite differently to these guys, I think. Um, this, what they did actually is they had like um, a Garmin GPS particular model where you can get the, some feed out of it and then an APRS radio and the two were linked together by a cable. So it's quite simple, the two pieces of one handheld APRS and one handheld Garmin and a cable. No custom stuff really. 
although they had to do quite a lot of repairs on the radio to get it working. And that basically chirped so they can have APIS where just the whole time. And then they had a they, they had an offline version of Google Earth and they were plotting where it was in the time on that. And my payload, because we had it up there, actually I've been just given this um, Digi Digi what's it, Digi XT radio module kit, nine nine hundred megahertz and in the States you can go up to one watt. So I had a one watt, 900 megahertz transmitter then. I had a big uh, uh, remote controlled car battery as well. So it was a pretty heavy duty payload compared to what you guys did. But what I was, well, the temptation of the radio modem is actually, it's a Linux thing, so if it, when it was working, you, 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 you could talk to it over a network and have like a, a Unix shell open up, you know? Yeah. And then you had the radio modem, you were doing the same thing. You could actually log into it and everything. And I just, I just the temptation of that, particularly if you had a long flight or you wanted to upload new commands or something, I thought I kind of found, found it irresistible. I still quite like to do it. And I was talking to it in theory at 9600 board, but I had very bad comms on the balloon flight. Later on we found it because of a broken antenna. It was just a whip antenna on the, on the radio radio kit and um, it was just very, very poor simple like that. And if we'd known, we could have probably got much better communication. So I didn't get that much science out of it. Um, but I still got intermittent calls all the way up. I had, I mean, you know, when I talk about the C library being difficult and so on, what I couldn't get was any useful data out of it. When I tried to ask it what the pressure was and temperature was and so on, it just came back everything off scale. So I don't know whether it's hardware or software, or whatever. It was disappointing, but it was a first try. You know, we could have fixed it all if we'd had more balloons. But that was the approach we took. It well, didn't quite, didn't quite work the first time. I have, a, I have the balloon being launched, if people want to see it, I'm sure you see lots of balloons launched. And the guy held his camera in the wrong orientation. So just, you know, uh, yeah. There's the cable between the two. And it's just a very, very clean launch. I mean, Black Rock is winged by mountains. So they've done similar predictions to you to try and make sure it came down in the Black Rock desert and not somewhere else. We came within a mile or two of landing in the mountains, then we would have been very unhappy. And they tried another flight the next day using somebody else who didn't have like helium and that, like, I would have been tracking that one. But yeah, the, the, the infrastructure these guys had worked pretty well. And that was the only time, driving around trying to chase it, that was the first time I appreciated what kind of drive cars we really were for. <laughs> that terrain. So we had a flight of about two hours, we recovered it nicely, we saw it actually land in front of us, because you can, you can really get better now than you're actually on the plaza itself, on the player itself. And we recovered it in, in, uh, in good order, except for the antenna fault. So we didn't get the science out of that we wanted, but we did at least prove that the overall infrastructure worked. I had comms, I had, again, everything was off scale, so it was useless scientifically, but I did get a signal near its burst point from my side of the payload. And that's all I'm interested in, frankly, to trigger it, you know. I don't care if I only get half an hour or 60 minutes out of my side of it. I just need to be able to trigger it at the appropriate point. And I'm a passenger from then on. I'm always a passenger. I just rely on, on your guys. I'm very humble about it, what you guys can do for me, or what my colleagues in America can do for me, and then I'm a passenger. And you, you track it, and I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever unreliable, wacky stuff. You know, the PC one of four cars or whatever. Can you make it and ensure it that the tracking is just mission? Not as well, not uh, I don't think you have to ensure. Yeah, I thought you said what else. Yeah. There we do. I mean, <coughs> it's a good point. It's a bit bigger than something. I wouldn't, wouldn't be so big the second time round. It was just literally, I didn't design it. What was the total weight? Nine pounds, I think. So that was about three. The whole thing was okay. You know, it was in the red to the end. Just. Everything, the, the, the full stack came in a bit less than I thought it would be, and so I'm really okay. I would have lost um, ice packs when I needed to make the test flight, so I've just not taken the full complement of ice packs. I don't know what temperature was at, but the ice packs came back completely frozen, which was good, and the water was circulating in, although the heater wasn't on, I left the motor on on this test, and the water came, and the, 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 the pump had stopped, but it was still liquid water in the line. I would suggest to me it didn't freeze solid. That it, it did well it, it kept it above, close to above freezing. And the pump probably stopped the water from <coughs> So, yeah, I, I was relatively happy on that side of things. 
Now moving on, you know, so we fixed everything we need to fix. So we had this rocket launch coming up. That was that was the next exciting bit. And this is us with my team. I say my team, it was my idea, but from the moment we started going, it was absolutely a community of equals, although it was, you know, it was my name on the time as well. Um, and here we are squeezing into the rocket supports, rocket uh, yes, it's, it's, it's wound quartz, it's, it's radio transparent but very tough. Uh, uh, the rockets down this bit, we've got these, these, these couplets between various bits that look just like what Ed just showed with you, but the split in half with the parachute coming in between. And this is my bit of it. And we're squeezing the payload in there. That's Mel, she's an extremely competent neck biologist. That's Rainbow Low and um, Ed, I forget you've seen there, Ed Campion, that's it. They were two six formers who came out, they won a competition and came out with us, and they were extremely helpful. And that's me, and that's Paul, Paul Shepard, he's um, a sort of FEA expert for building design, fire and evidence analysis expert. And originally we were going to 3D print the whole thing, he does 3D printing, but in the eventuality we just didn't have time, but we might do next time. Um, but it turns out he could be extremely competent at um, like C programming and electronics and things like that. So you've got like, you know, molecular biology into into uh, biology and, and then sort of hard electronics in that picture. And that's how the team builds up. But actually the day job titles completely outside those areas of expertise. And um, this was something an artist colleague asked me to take, because artists tend to have a lot more fun than scientists do. They have, they have much broader uh, opportunity to um, use their enthusiasm and so on. They don't have to concentrate on their day job. Their day job is doing wonderful new artistic interventions in the world. So she was very interested. She's actually a very well trained biochemist. Her name is Anna Dimitri, who she works at the University of Brighton. And this was Homo serine, homo serine lactone, which is a, effectively a bacterial hormone. So bacteria is typical to other bacteria, even with different species into variants of this chemical. And so she said, well, why don't you, if there is any, why don't you release some, if there are any bacteria in altitude, why don't you release some homo serine bacteria and all in, from your balloon, that would be like saying, take it to your leader. You know? <laughs> um, just a little bit of whimsy, a little bit of, a little bit of fun. And NASA said, no, you can't do that. You know, can't release anything from me. So I said, well, it's, a, it's a, like, you know, every bacteria on Earth does this. And they said, no. So we, we sealed it up completely as a sort of mute protest against silly, City regulations, and it was on there, but it couldn't be. It couldn't be. Really. But that's that's the sort of thing. I mean, we laugh at it, but Anna and her colleagues are so interested in, in what we're doing. You know, you might end up doing quite an interesting project with them, and that makes that that they're part of the people helping you do it because they've got the expertise, and you get involved with a whole extra community of people you wouldn't expect to. So I'm very happy to, to work with them. So that's us sliding it in. And that's just a bit of so, uh, the, those the main sampling syringe that takes the area. And these syringes next to it are effectively being used as clamp valves. They're pushing down on the tubing and they're, they're crimping it so you can take the area in and then shut it off and then open up the other crimp and push the air into the main chamber and so on. So you keep pumping air in. And that's loading the rocket on the rail. So, those of you who know your rockets, I think that was a P class. And you can only go up to K and then you can what? Yeah. <laughs> where, do you like Zs or whatever? No, no, I was just thinking we're going to go up to the end. Oh, there you go. It doubles every time you go up to yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. P, well, it went like a bat out of hell. I don't have a good video of that one. Yeah, it's a, it's a couple of classes over what we've got to find. It was a bit, it was a bit small. Yeah. I thought we only went up to K and that's the bit of the Oh, no, no, no. no. M's. M's and M's. So the whole team, the Rocket Mavericks team is there, but I think it's too murky for me to, to give a name call. And I'm happy to show people that later. I just particularly like to thank Thomas Aitkerson, who is the, the head of Rocket Mavericks. But again, there's a community people who help me deal with this. And there's uh, Rob Briody, who's their main engineer, who's really skilled, uh, Thomas engineer, to help me build on that. And there's the big red button. Because all rocket launchers ought to have a big red button, maybe balloon launchers ought to have one too. <laughs> and I got to press it because I've designed the, uh, designed the payload. We've got a couple of other cameras, but there's most of them just launching pictures of, um, you know, 
you only see the rocket launch for a second, so I'm not going to play in the back to you. But that one, unfortunately, we lost the footage, but after the launch, everybody broke out of manhunts. So I was like, about the scene, but it was intense. Male bonding, male bonding, everybody was manhugging. And then, as that happens on balloon launches, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's what we had. So that one went up to about Mark 1.4, and it went up to about 28,000 feet. Um, we weren't able to fit the, the balloon, the balloon payload on another rocket, which I'll show you later, which would have gone much higher. But still, it's nice to test things out. And those digi radio modems, I can really recommend them because this thing was going up to 28,000 feet at Mark 1.4. This time round. Again, with just the whip aerial, we have absolutely custom, clear, uh, crystal clear ponds, right? And I was seeing the, the Unix shell from the payload as I was logged into it, and it was saying I'm something now, and now I'm going to sleep, and so on. Perfect. So um, we can discuss it later. That particular wavelength and modem is not available in Europe. They do have, what was it, 653? kilohertz version at 350 milliamps or something which would, might give us really quite a lot of range and again this idea that not just chirping back telemetry you're actually interacting with the computer remotely it's quite fun i think it's something that might be worth trying at least just trying they're not particularly expensive at the moment now so um we didn't have a tracker on this we were just everybody looking to see where it came down and I saw a little speck under what looked like an orange strip falling like this. And we went out and followed it with all the other people. And what we found was... <laughs> tiny, leaf. What we found was that the whole nose cone of the rocket snapped off and the nose cone was buried about 70 centimetres into the ground. <laughs> Not a good sign. We did a pose there because this bit looked okay and I still had a thought when we take it out, you know, I'd be able to get some samples out. Um, but it was not to be. Where was the parachute? Sorry? Where was the parachute? Well, that's a good question. It's over here somewhere. Um, yeah. What had happened was, and I'll show you what I've got there. What had happened was, the main parachute had failed, and they had a backup parachute that some bugger forgot to pack the germs on. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that. It's wrapped up a bit because. Um, because it's all spiky in places. Yeah, no. So those of you who can't, I'll pass this round if you can. For so those of you who can't um, see what I'm holding, this is all that was left. It's still shedding bits around. That was like, that was like what Ed had done. <laughs> really, that's what, I mean, from the barometer on the, on the, because on, on their flight computer, from the barometer on that, um, they reckon it hit the ground at about 600 miles an hour, something. And it buried itself, I'm going into metro now, which is naughty, it buried itself about 77 meters in the ground, and I did the sun, that's about 2,000 G. And um, that's, that's there. Now, I don't know, you know, I'll pass this round as well, because I really am seriously interested if anybody knows how to repair it, although I suspect it's a multi node PCB. This was there's the nose cone of the rocket and all this had some padding on it and so on what i think did the most damage is that this as it hot steamed in it gave an immense wrench on the data cable and if you look at that you will see it's bent the pins on this right up but it's, and it's bent the pcb a bit and i haven't got it but i actually sent this back and said can you just tell me if any of these boards are uh, uh, so I know I've been validating my loyalty. <laughs> they actually sent me a letter back saying we can't repair it, but just out of interest, you know, I've never seen anything you've ever built destroyed so completely, and I'd just like to know what you did to it. <laughs> but you know, it certainly takes eight G. Eight G Mark Mark Five Four is working fine, um, and it, I think you know this was like an enormous. Um, Airbag, you know, and the, it was the cable wrench that did damage. Um, you know, have a look at the lock process round. But that's not the end of the story. Well, it's the end of my story. It's extremely depressed by that point. 
Um, but if, even if it was flawed or too heavy or whatever, I could have come back and tried it, taken to bits and tried it on the ground, applied, blown it and so on. And it, it's obviously extremely annoying. I never plucked the hand. Excuse me. It's obviously extremely annoying that it got to um, this this point. Now, however, uh, rocket mavericks hadn't, hadn't finished at this point. What we got there is the flights, and these were sponsored by Sony, and these had downward looking cameras. What you have here is you had, I think, three P class motors there, and one P class motor there, uh, and if this had worked perfectly, this might have gone over 300,000 feet. So that's the temptation of sticking with these guys and working out a black rock. You can, you can, you can that, that go into space. You, you can't be in space, you'd be above the carbon layer. Um, and so, I mean, I think it was probably foolish to try and build a payload to do better things, but you can see where the temptation came from. Now, I, do, I didn't have a particularly good video of my rocket launching, in the first time was my rocket. I do have a video of this one working. Separated. I think it, the mark shock for that interacting with the mark shock of the first stage, I think it ripped a panel off the parachute mechanism or something, so the parachute didn't open properly. So that's the three P stage they found there. And then the second stage going off, you know, you know, in the spin at the last moment, that parachute can come up. I don't know how much that one was, but that one, as you can see, that one required a lot of effort. <laughs> <laughs> I realise that that's, uh, that's another rocket somebody tried to buy and the parachute didn't work on that one either. Um, what happened to that one was the parachute cords, as it was tumbling, the parachute cords got stuck to the hot motor. And it, they gave up trying to dig that one out. The law within the player, you've got to leave it completely spotless if you found it. And um, so the, the, the ritual, if you can't dig your rocket out, it's just too buried. You take whatever's sticking out the surface, and then you, you drink a swig of beer, and you pour the beer into the crater as an offering to the player dance, and then you cover up the remains. <laughs> they dug these ones out. Um, you know, the parachute opening for rocketry at those speeds, I mean, as Ed has just taken you through, is extremely difficult. Um, because they're supersonic, it's not a problem for the balloon community so much. For the rocket people, they need to deal, either get their uh, parachute to come out at the exact moment when it's motionless at the very top of its arc, and then it can inflate on the way down, or you've got to have supersonic opening parachutes, so I think it's very close to the name just describe it to you. It's not at all easy to do, but you know. Now, I know that now. If I know that now, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have built a payload that I didn't mind losing. Uh, if I did it over again, one approach, for instance, is to build a disposable payload when you don't want to get it back. Because after all, I'm doing my twist the X amplification in flight, and I either get a signal or I don't, and I'm radioing the signal back. So that as soon as I have that signal, it would be nice to get it back to examine it in the lab, but the main science of it is done. So, so you're doing that presumably either because it's going to come down like this and you won't get your sample right. Yeah. But also, if you say you want to do this on Mars, you can do it. Yeah. But it would detect. This, I mean, you know, I've made certain assumptions in, what, in my detection regime that I'm looking for organisms that have DNA and that have the 16S signal. And if they don't have it, I won't see them. 
So then everybody does that. And they say, look, I found something. And I look at the bacteria they found, like they find bacteria that don't generate spores. And I say, I don't believe one word of that. So you've got the same problem about keeping your drone and seeing spores in there? Yeah, I have. Yes, I have. But at least if I can prove it's clean going up, and I'm not sampling, and I find something at altitude, there's no possibility of it being ground contamination. So if you really say, if you sample, say, you take a sample, say, halfway up. Yeah, that's what I mean. Some we weren't getting anything below. That's exactly what I've been discussing recently on the whole of the PCR, I mean, if something's there, PCR will find that you go out and amp it up massively. Yeah. You're going from one, one strip of DNA to yeah. billions. In my PhD, I found something which I think I traced back to work being done in another laboratory, next to the laboratory, where they made the sample that they emailed to their things that I cost eight years previously. That's what I think happened. You're very... It can it can definitely give you false positives. If it gives you the DNA of a known sex abuser who is in the air at the time and doesn't have an alibi, then it's probably reasonable. But otherwise I think it, you know, I shake your hands so you turn up murdered. Does that mean because my DNA is on your hand that I must have murdered you because of some peak at the KHS? But, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean sometimes what people write into it, and it's exactly the same in terms of biology, right? How to make it all sterile, I don't, well, I've got some ideas. You need to, step to, yeah? Uh, well, the sterile thing, uh, for the rocket, I don't want to know kind of research into how much is going to get stuck onto the rocket as it's going up, because I mean, there's a band there, but... Yeah, I mean, I, the rocket is sort of a harder... It's spare to platform than the balloon, but I wasn't going to pass it up. Well, the, the balloon has, uh, the worst problem is not got that high speed there going past to, to stop to make it hard for stuff to appear. Well, of course, I wasn't relying on the theory. I mean, all right, this is what my, my, my mentality was. It's at about one ten millibar. That's a hundredth of an atmosphere. If I have a 50 milliliter syringe and I put it out, then that is equivalent to sucking in a half a mil at ground level. And so I've got half a mil and I have to push it into something else. But if I do that enough times, I begin to suck a meaningful amount of air. Um, as I said, I mean, it, it's commonly forming, if you grow on a petri dish, the numbers are quite low here on the ground. Adjusting for pressure, they'll be extremely low. And so that's the other reason I don't believe the numbers. And a balloon that could drift for a long distance where I can pump a really meaningful volume into it, that's probably the best way to do it. A rocket samples a very large length in a very quick amount of time, so you probably do want to stick it to something like that. How you make the balloon a rocket star, I don't know. Both for rockets and balloons, what I am thinking in my, my biohacker zone, for both of them, I think peroxide is, hydrogen peroxide is the gold standard. That's again from Vikings that you soak stuff in, say, 3% peroxide overnight, and it's stellar. Not only does it not have DNA or anything alive on it, you've even broken down sort of complex organic chemicals that you might think came from something alive. So nobody soaks stuff in 3% peroxide. They might, they just can't. When they launch a probe to Mars now, they say it's acceptable if it's got less than 100 colony forming units per meter squared, which I think is ridiculous. You're probably inoculating Mars all the time. Uh, the Viking <coughs> they are trying to autoclave the entire land that including the computer. I don't think they succeeded. They tried a lot to try and make a computer you could actually autoclave in hot steam. 121 degrees. Well, I don't really. Autoclaving kills organisms, it doesn't kill DNA. Yeah. You can get DNA from an autoclave sample. I'm not having that. It's go, you've got to coat the instant. I think you can't do the latex weather balloon. Those of you who've been following what I've been discussing, I'm thinking probably of applying a solar balloon instead. So they're made of bin bags, they're made of polyethylene. You can probably find a plastic the standard for oxide, and then you've got, you know, it's not, the altitude's not so high, but you have a chance of completely sterilizing the balloon. Jim? Sorry about that. We've got a few people, a few from the States who have met um, and ready to go. I just want to Okay, let's move on. Sorry. I was waiting on that. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.